Jim? Yes, you are. Yay! Take two. <laughs> and I'm so excited that we took two because not only are we gifted and blessed, you have Peter. How do you say your last name again, Peter? I don't want to misspell it. <laughs> like, Let, like, like love. Loveine. Loveine. Oh my God, that's awesome. We're going to write that down. Wait one second. It's a beautiful Love. name. <laughs> Thanks, Love. Dad. Vine. Perfect. Love Vine. I love it. So we're really excited for this show. We have, um, we're taking two because the first broadcast wasn't going out correctly. And I never want to waste anyone's time on the show that it doesn't work. So thank you, Jim, for, for restarting and taking the time to restart. We really appreciate it. So we have a new guest on our show, Peter Levine, who, Judy, can you share his information? Then I'll introduce everybody else. Certainly. And Judy, my co-host, is a, an incredible gift to the show. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Peter G. Levine. Am I saying that right? Yes, ma'am. It's an American medical researcher and science educator and authority on stroke recovery. His articles have been published extensively in peer-reviewed journals on brain plasticity as it relates to stroke with emphasis on modified induced therapy. His articles have been widely cited by the medical community. His two, 2013 book, Stronger After Stroke, is regarded as a guide for patients and therapists dealing with stroke, and it has received numerous positive reviews. His seminars throughout the United States were described by one reviewer as funny, entertaining, engaging, dynamic, well-organized, passionate, and lighthearted. I, we welcome our special guest, uh, Peter Levine. Take it away, Peter. Thank, thank you for joining us, Peter. I just wanna re go around one more time because um, for new viewers, of course, Judy Marlowe is my co-host. We're, we're inviting Eileen Lichtenstein. I'm getting it, Eileen. And Stacey Kaplan back from the first show. And then I'm so happy that we restarted this show because, ah, you know, I got to tell you, last time you were on the show, Mark, I was like, what are they crazy? CBS, ABC, NBC. You should be uh, back in the mainstream. And I thought to myself, well, if they don't want them, we want them. <laughs> so Judy reached out to you and she's like, hey, do you want to co-host with us? And you said, yes. Yeah. I'm so I happy. Hope you, uh, Renee. Uh, I, I'm an idiot. I forgot no. the first no. show. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I took the dog out for a walk. I'm hot and sweaty. But no, that's here okay. I am. Here I am. Yes. And you're wonderful. And Peter, just, I don't know if you know Mark's story, but Mark, get, I know you're here to interview, but Peter's new on our show. So give Peter a little bit of insight because he we already gave him insights about our history on the first go round of the show with Stacy, myself, 
um, I, what Eileen does and Judy, of course, but give Peter a little bit of insight because Peter didn't suffer a stroke. He is a supporter and, a, you know, he does. Um, Renee, just one moment. I still do not see it on Facebook. It, it is. I shared it. I shared okay. it. Okay. I shared it. Okay. Go so ahead, Mark. Share, share with Peter a little bit because I'm sure Peter wants to know a little bit of history of your stroke story. Okay. Well, uh, Peter, I had a massive stroke. Mm -hmm. I was in a coma for two days, intensive care for a week, hospital for a month, rehab for a year. I too have written a book. Uh, I uh, speak all around the country as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, hey, I'm here to uh, help people know that you can overcome and come back from uh, a, a stroke. I wouldn't wish a stroke on my worst enemy. Uh, uh, strokes are terrible. But uh, what I knew about a stroke before I had one was zero. What I know now could fill a room. So here I am, uh, hopefully, to, uh, uh, to give uh, uh, people uh, uh, inspiration for them. Uh, they can say, if he can do it, I can do it. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you. Did, Peter, did you, do you know Mark? Did you know Mark? Did you know Mark from his, because he was, um, he was, uh, was a CBS journalist and popular television and news personality who served for many years in a variety of high profile positions, including anchoring. Um, he's met and interviewed people like President Clinton, President George Bush, Ger Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Stevie, Steven Spielberg. I mean, he was, he was, he was, he was on a wonderful road in his life. And, um, and, you know, I think it's really important for, for me to state that for new viewers to share that it can happen to anyone at any particular time. It doesn't matter what, um, what, it doesn't matter about anything in your life. You know, it doesn't matter about what faith you are, what color you are, or what size you are. It doesn't matter. It hits us all. It hits us all at any particular time. So I just thought it was important to give you a little roundabout of who the guests are today so that you could share your importance information with us. So tell us, uh, my first question to you, Peter, and I know Mark and Judy and Eileen and Stacy probably have questions as well, but I wanna kick it off with, with asking like how you got, uh, what drove you to do this type of work? What drove you to do this type of work? Um, so, so first of all, I, I don't think I've ever met Mark, but of course I know his story. It's, it's famous in the annals of stroke recovery. Um, he, I do believe that he came to University of Cincinnati when I worked there and he did a talk, one of his famous talks. It was relatively early after his stroke. And uh, so it's good to see, see you again, Mark. Um, although I was just a face in the crowd, um, big fan. And uh, so how did I get into it? Um, I have a clinical degree in physical therapy. It was a second degree and a second career for me. Um, my first degree was in communication, which is not important, but um, my first career was as a drummer in rock bands. And I know. That's why you like the music. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Guilty. So, but you know, that part of my life, I was in a band eventually uh, signed to a major label touring MTV, the whole thing. The, the point is that there's a great kinship between stroke survivors and athletes and musicians. The same things that work for athletes and musicians, which is a heck of a lot of practice, also work for stroke survivors at any point in the arc of their recovery. So unlike some of the brain healing stuff that happens directly after the stroke within the first two or three months after that plateau that you guys are all familiar with, there's a lot of neuroplastic change that can be driven if you look at stroke survivors as low level athletes playing a higher stakes game. So when I um, got my clinical degree in physical therapy, um, I almost immediately got a job at the Kessler Institute. Now I do talks around the country. They're not like Mark's talks, which are, are great affairs, but minor slogs of six hours of 
continuing education courses for occupational and physical therapists. So they're very sort of sci the science-y part of it. Um, and when I go um, and, and talk to therapists, I always learn a whole bunch of things from them. Um, but one of the things that I can impart to them is that it's the stuff that you do well as a therapist um, that's going to let you know how the stroke survivor feels. And I always encourage therapists to try to learn a very difficult motor skill, because if they're not willing to challenge themselves, how can they ask stroke survivors to challenge themselves to that level? Every neuroscience student, if you have a bachelor's degree in neuroscience, one of the requirements is that you have to learn to juggle because the thinking is it's so cognitive and so motoric that you'll get great insight into the brain if you have to learn this very difficult thing. So, um, you know, Renee Marie, you said you were a singer. I played drums, you know, as well as I do. I also understand Renee, Renee Marie, that you were a softball player. Did I catch that yes, from one of you? Yes, and I'm actually, I, I totally get and agree with your philosophy on softball music or sports music um, being the basis because I'm writing another book and the name of the book is Extra Inning because I'm in the extra inning of my life and what am I going to do with it? And I'm all my shows, if you stream back and you watch, I talk about the lessons that I learned during the coaching when I was growing up. And I use those tools from softball to successfully get to the point I am. And I think it's so important that you're bringing that to the forefront. Yeah, and it, it brings up a whole bunch of stuff. And this is a little bit of a tangent, but um, maybe Eileen might be uh, interested in, is, in this kind of stuff. So um, I, I was always terrible at baseball and, and obviously softball as well. Um, one of the things that always flummoxed me was how you were supposed to catch a very high pop ball. I'd always get very nervous and I wouldn't know where to put my hands. So it turns out that if you imagine you, Renee Marie, imagine catching a high pop ball. You will imagine it. And the part of the brain that lights up in you will be exactly the part of the brain that would light up if you caught the ball. So if you actually do it, or if you imagine you mentally practice catching a ball, the same part of the brain lights up. But it goes even further. If you watch somebody catching a pop ball, the same part of the brain lights up. And there's studies where they show it's exactly the same part of the brain. If I'm catching with the right hand, it's on the left side of the brain, it's the same cortical real estate. So that has huge implications for stroke survivors because if they watch somebody doing something like walking, they'll walk better. It'll take a little while, but they'll walk better. As long as they're practicing their walking, with what we call action observation, that is watching somebody walk. If they imagine walking the way they did prior to their stroke, and this is some of the research that our lab did, seminal research into mental practice. Um, if they uh, imagine walking the way they did prior to their stroke, their brain will change and they'll get better, what we call kinematically, they'll get better walking. They'll be more coordinated, more functional. So it gives you three different ways. You can actually practice something, you can mentally practice something, or you can watch somebody else do it well. And all three of those will activate the part of the brain dedicated to whatever movement you're looking for. Now, here's the problem though. Sorry. If I, sorry, do you have a question? Oh, Eileen, Eileen, Eileen get... is so excited to share so something. I'm excited for interrupting you. I apologize. Why don't you continue? Go ahead. Do you remember what you wanted to say, Eileen? I remember, believe me. I'll okay. remember this. <laughs> okay. So I just have one little caveat, and then we'll get Eileen, because I know, you know, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure she has some insight. So uh, the, the, the only problem is with that whole idea is that you have to be good at the skill uh, prior to mentally practicing it. So if I were to mentally practice a catching a high pop ball, 
I would mentally practice the ball hitting me awkwardly on the head the way it did so many <laughs> times on the baseball field. So, you, but here's the thing. Um, if you did the skill prior to your stroke, that it's called a motor schema, a motor engram. You don't know, need to know any of this, but that memory is in there. And the idea is to activate it. So even a very low level stroke survivor, as long as they did the skill prior to their stroke, um, they'll activate that part of the brain and it helps as long as they're willing to practice the actual thing that is actually walking around the same time that they're mentally practicing. And that's all I wanted to add. So you got to be good at the skill to begin with. Okay, Eileen, thanks for waiting. <laughs> so that's, that's one of the skills I've learned as an adult is to be more patient. <laughs> anyway. Amen. <laughs> anyway, um, I never, thank goodness, experienced a stroke, but I had a severe accident. My foot was run over. And thank God it was only my foot when I fell down in the street. And it wasn't my spine, it wasn't my head. I was in the middle of owning a dance and exercise studio. And everything I heard you just say, Peter, is, is, was about my recovery, no stroke, and the visualization having been in such good condition, mind, body, memory, and all that, that I healed perfectly well, five bone breaks, but I was perfectly fine. And in a very short time, and um, I was able to, to believe <laughs> the local physician who told me in the middle of my recovery with my foot up high in the whatevers, you'll be just fine by October, because he was asking me to run a stress reduction program with him, with my movement program, moving meditation, fitness for his patients that were mostly people in wheelchairs and it all happened and i'm i'm so happy to share this wow <laughs> <laughs> well i i actually always had said that in life people need to do the work prior to anything happening you always have to prepare for the what if and you really need to do your work and in life is not just about getting up and just, um, you know, wasting your life. It's about what is you going to do with it? What, you know, like, you know, what, what, what are you going to learn in life? You need to learn things so you could like Dr. Um, Levine, Lo, Levine, Levine, Levine <laughs> stated that I want to get it correctly that, um, that, you know, you have to, it's almost like you have to plant all those pieces in your brain. You have to store them in your brain. On the on the on the on the flip side is like Eileen believes that you should, and Eileen, Judy, and Mark and Stacy believe that don't plant those negative things in your brain. You got to plant those positive and those educational things in your brain, so that when something does happen to you, you are as prepared as you can. Like when I played softball, like I was ready. I was there. I was ready to play that game. When, when the game was at four, I was there at two waiting for on the bench. Like, where is everybody? I want to play. So, yeah. So anybody else want to feed into what uh, Peter had said, Mark? I have a question for Peter. Uh, Peter, um, therapists, I, I always say it's people like them who help people like me. Um, for a guy... I went to a conference in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, sat next to a therapist. And I said, I just want to say thank you to you because you helped me and then you go on to the next person and help them. But the person you helped me never ever forgets you helped me. Peter, can you talk a bit about the mindset of people who decide to go down that path? That's a great question. And because I do so many talks to clinicians, I get to meet a lot of them. And two things. First of all, a lot of the ideas, like I often say to, to the people that are there, um, if you have any good ideas, you need to let me know because then I'll present your idea tomorrow and 
and maybe I'll write it into my next, the next edition of my book and I'll give you absolutely no credit. That's the way the whole thing works, right? Is, is you keep stealing ideas from people. And so that's, but, but more to your point, Mark, thank you. Great, great question. Um, the, okay, so I'll give you an example. A therapist will come up to me during a break and she'll say, I've got this guy. And it's always, I, I call them, I got this guy questions. They come up to you and they get in your face and they say, I got this guy and I don't know what to do. He keeps falling. He has balance issues. He has hemianopsia. He, he, he's uh, receptively aphasic. So I don't know how to get through to him. And then he twists his body and he's, he's spastic in one side. And it's, it's this big thing. And I look at the therapist's face and there's a tear coming down. And I'm like, is this your dad? Are we talking about your dad? We're not talking about their dad. We're talking about this guy that she's working with or that he's working with. And the level of empathy is just extraordinary. I don't think you survive in that business unless you really care about people on some other level. My wife is a physical therapist. Uh, she has that gene. My daughter is going into speech therapy. She has that gene, but you got to have it. And uh, it's, the, it's the foundation uh, of a lot of stuff. I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that's that's what I got out of talking to a lot of these people. Right. Judy, do you have a question for Peter by any chance? Well, he made a very good point. No, I at the moment, no, I don't. But uh, it's a very good point. Stacy, do you have anything to ask Peter? Oh, not at the moment, no. Okay, just wanted to make sure everybody had a platform. I have so, another one today, if I may. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so I'm a um, level two certified EFT tapping practitioner, emotional freedom techniques. So I just, um, I'm asking, are you familiar with that modality? No. Well, we'll talk about it more offline. And if you quote me, I want to be represented in your book. <laughs> no, I, I don't think you listened. I don't give credit. Once I steal the idea, it's mine. Oh, I'm just a collector. Well, just, I don't even remember how many people. No, I'll tell you what. Let, let me just lay this out there now. My email address, and I don't care who has it, it's stronger after stroke. One word. If you stick them all together, stronger after stroke at Yahoo. I expect an email from you, Eileen. Thank you. Sure. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so let's let's talk about like your books because I know you've written a book called Stronger After Strokes and that, of course that's your email address as well. So what's the what was because I know you you've updated them and you've um, written other editions of the same book. What is the first one based on? What what if we buy that book? What is the information that we could find in that book? You know, one thing I have to say about the American system of healthcare is that it's not great for stroke survivors. Um, the book sell, it's been translated into a few languages and it sells overseas. And one of the, the criticisms I get about the book from people from Europe, especially is that because I talk so much about the fact that uh, if you've had a brain injury in the United States, you're often discharged at plateau. Um, and then on the, at the beginning of rehab, you're rushed into rehab when you're not yet prepared. And Mark talked about being in a coma. A lot of times people in the second or third day will be stuck in a rehab hospital or a skilled nursing facility and forced to do a lot of work. And they just, the brain isn't there yet. So, um, I wrote the book as a DIY book for stroke survivors so that once they were What's DIY, I'm uh, sorry. do it, do it yourself, do okay. it yourself, okay. sort of a, you know, what, okay. So you're discharged from therapy. Now, what do you do? What do you do now? What can I do? You know, is this big plateau, you know, the, the therapist, you know, discharged me. They got rid of me when I plateaued. Is that the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end? Uh, what do I do now? So it was taking a lot of neuroscience, a lot of the research that came out of our lab, a lot of the research that came out of other labs and putting it into something that was readable for everybody. Um, it was originally written for therapists and uh, 
the publisher said, we like your book, but we want you to bring it down so that everybody can read it. So I spent about three months rewriting the book uh, in very simple, as simple as I could get it. As Einstein once said, as simple as possible, but no simpler. And, uh, and it just goes through all these treatment options and how you might be able to do it at home. Hopefully, un, you know, with a therapist around so that you can talk to them with a doctor around so that you stay safe. Um, but it's all really simple stuff, stuff like what I mentioned before, mental practice, or um, we also call it mental imagery, or what's called action observation, where you observe somebody doing something well. Um, things like mirror therapy, um, things like constraint-induced therapy, which we've done a lot of work with. These are simple core concepts, the kinds of concepts that if a basketball tr uh, player had trouble going left and they couldn't use their left hand very well, um, they would spend a few months using just their left hand. That's what constraint-induced therapy is. It is forcing use of the affected side to the point where that side has to rewire. It's a whole bunch of really simple stuff brought to um, – to stroke survivors and caregivers and therapists. Um, I have a question. And, yes, ma'am. You, you, sorry, because otherwise I'll forget. You <laughs> said okay. that I have to rewire. I just want to give hope to people that it can be rewired. Yes, but, um, you know, you are an athlete and you already mentioned that you showed up two hours before practice and you're just waiting for everybody to show up. Athletes and musicians love to practice. I think that's what... Like you're not going to get good at a sport. You're not going to get good uh, at a at a musical instrument if you don't love practicing. So, um, but there's a lot of people that don't love practicing. Here's a here's a little tidbit. So it turns out, and they've done some research, and there's some correlation between being an athlete prior to your stroke and recovery, as opposed to somebody who was not an athlete and their recovery. The trajectory is much stronger among athletes. Um, why? Because they know how to practice. Because they're not afraid of the process. Because they know that there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. So, um, but constraint-induced therapy is an oven mitt on the unaffected side. In the lower extremity, it's a little bit different. In aphasia, it's a little bit different. Um, but but in the upper extremity, it's, it's easy to imagine. You put an oven mitt on the effect, uh, uh, on the good side, sorry, if you don't mind me saying good and bad, on yeah. the good side, forcing use of the affected side. Now, the only amount of movement that you need, because if you tied up the good side and forced, it's called forced use, you force use of the affected side, and they can't open their hand, that's just mean. So you have to find the right kind of people. And to qualify for that treatment, and I wish I had a washcloth here, but all you have to be able to do is pick up and release a washcloth three times in one minute. So that's very nominal amounts of movement. May I ask you, Renee Marie, do you, how, so it's your, your right side at Hemi. My and right side. Your right side. And can I see you open and close your hand? So you have great movement. I mean, you're overqualified for constraint use therapy. Yeah, yeah, Are, but 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 I but but the bottom line is that I'm still a little bit, you know, off balance. And to me, to me, because I am a I'm an athlete, I want to keep improving my my structure, you know, what I do. I don't want it, it's never enough. You always come back, you review. You learn and then you take the next step. So that's, you know, where I'm coming from. Are you, are you right-handed uh, prior yeah. to your stroke? I'm ambidextrous um, now. <laughs> you are. Look at you. Look at you growing. Um, so let me ask you this. Are you able to throw a softball with your right hand? Yes. And I played softball after I had my stroke. I still played third base. So my, my reflexes were there. I was still played in. Because the you know the the the, the batter is going to hit the ball or bunt the ball, so I play, yep. still played in, 
um, I, I had a good throw back when I was practicing and using the structure because once again, it goes back to the memory, right? You pick it up, you throw the ball. Sometimes it went off because just naturally, uh, you know, if I wasn't in the, the correct mindset that day or something, it would go off or I couldn't reach or whatever. But I still, I still was able to, I still was able to throw the ball to third base, first base from third. Uh, That's Peter, tough. Uh, Mark, and I'm also right-handed, but I do everything left-handed because this hand tends to shake and uh, it's can't count on it like you used to. When I was writing and my writing was all squiggly and I thought, heck with this, I'm doing everything left-handed. And people say I couldn't do that. And I say you could if you had to. Now, um, Peter, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, uh, getting things back. When I first had my stroke, I got so much back right away because so much had been lost. But little things like tapping my foot to a song, they told me I'd never be able to do that. So one day I'm sitting around listening to music and my right foot is tapping to the beat of the song. <laughs> without me even thinking about it. I thought, cool, <laughs> very cool. Peter, talk about that. Talk about gains as you get further and further away from what they call the event. You know what I need for, to answer that question, Mark? I need my brain. <laughs> so I brought, I, I, I do these Zoom talks sometimes and I always forget my props. So I, I remembered my brain today. <laughs> It's good to know. You can't forget this. You it's know, good. sometimes I think if it wasn't attached, I'd forget it. <laughs> oh, I gotta go back to the house and I gotta get my brain. So um, let me just open this up. This is the middle of the brain. This big uh, green stripe is the corpus callosum. It's the only place where the two hemispheres uh, connect. And um, and if you can see, there's there's blood vessels. Let me skip this up. You see these blood vessels that come up. So you have this major artery, and then off of that, you have all these uh, uh, smaller arteries. And what happens is you, uh, in an ischemic stroke, um, and I know Renee Marie had an uh, ischemic stroke. Oh, wow. um, I don't think anybody here had a hemorrhagic stroke, right? My dad did. My dad did. did. Okay. You did. Okay. So it's, it's going to be different in, in a hemorrhagic stroke, but you have a, a let's say in ischemic stroke, you have a, a blockage. And so that whole area of that, that's um, innervated by that blood vessel uh, starts to uh, die. And uh, we call it an infarction, but it, it's dead neurons. Um, now, right after the stroke, there's an area, let me see if I can get my brain back together. There's an area that dies. Uh, let's just say it's about the size of a marble. And that is never coming back. It's dead. It's kaput, gone. You're never going to get it back. Around that area is a larger area, maybe the size of a golf ball. And that area is called the penumbra. And the penumbra is not dead after the stroke. It's alive. Um, and doctors and nurses work furiously to try to keep that alive because um, those neurons right after the stroke um, for the first seven days, but it's different for everyone, um, they are said to be stunned. So you have billions and billions of neurons that are not dead, they're stunned. And why are they not working? First of all, because their main blood supply is blocked by whatever blocked it, a thrombus or an embolus, some clot got in there. And they're working to, to clear that. The other thing is there's swelling in the brain. Um, cytokinins, enzymes, all the stuff that you don't need to know, but there's this metabolic soup that gets, that gunks everything up. And just like if you have swelling anywhere, like in an elbow or a finger, you can't move it very well. So these neurons right after the stroke, um, they're not working, but over time they come back. What time do they come back around, uh, from that first week through about three months? Now, it can be six months. It could be as long as a year that it takes that uh, part to come back. So this is why you get, and this goes to Mark's question, why you get that big bounce right at the beginning. You have a bunch of neurons, billions, sometimes millions per hour, billions per day, 
rushing back online. As soon as they clear the clot, the neurons start to come back. The plateau is the end of that process. So the neurons come back, they come back, they come back, and right about, usually in most people, it's about three months, but again, it could be three weeks, it could be a year. Right, all of those neurons have completely come back and you get this plateau. And it's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning, but that's when therapists in the United States at least have to discharge you. So I forgot what the question was. So, but, but that, but that, but that's why the other countries were asking you about your book because initially because you were writing it from an American perspective, where I know in other countries like China, I think um, um, one of our acupuncture friends or therapist shared that in China, I believe it's China. Was it China? I don't really know. I don't think, I don't know. I have to look back. But she said in China, acupuncture is a part of, it's got to be done within that first three months. Um, to a stroke patient. It's it's part of the healing process, part of the recovery process. Did you ever hear of that? Um, well, so the first three months are super important because you want to reintegrate uh, all of those neurons. What happens a lot of the time is something called learn non-use. The therapist is in, in, a, in a panic because they know that therapy is going to end and they want to get them safe and functional and out the door so they can live the rest of their life. Um, and so there's this mad rush to put AFOs on the feet and, and those are very necessary sometimes on the ankle um, to do other things. What's AFOs? Like, uh, ankle foot orthosis. Okay, because yeah, I don't you know. Don't, so. You don't know because you're running, you're playing softball. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, um, they come up with these, these things to get the person safe and functional. So uh, a, a stroke survivor may show up with a little, just a little bit of movement, something that would qualify them for something like constraint induced therapy, but, um, but it's ignored. And the reason it's ignored is because it's non-functional. Look, Mr. Smith, you're not going to be able to use that hand anytime soon. And, and uh, we'll hope for the best, but the fact is we need to get you uh, in a sling or we need to get you uh, safe uh, so that you can start to walk and uh, we'll worry about the hand later. Well, the hand is trying to tell you something. Those neurons are coming back online and it's trying with that little bit of movement, it's trying to tell you a lot. I mean, there's people who can never open their hand again. They're so spastic, it's locked. They get soft tissue shortening that even passively they can't open it anymore. Um, unfortunately, because we're in such a rush to get people out the door because humans are expensive in healthcare, that a lot of this really great movement is ignored. And then a process known as learn non-use comes in where the brain, that portion of the brain, the neurons are, are live, but they do what's called, not important term, but dendritic pruning. The dendrites start to prune away from each other. All the neurons are fine. Blood vessels are fine. The glial cells are fine. Everything's great. It's just, they're not using it. So what do we know about the brain? It's use it or lose it. And that portion of the brain then lies fallow for the rest of that uh, stroke survivor's life until some extraordinary therapist or a caregiver uh, goes back in and forces use. And this gets back to our original issue, I think, is that you said sometimes people uh, are, are motivated to move and sometimes they're not. And that's where forced use, if you have somebody two years after their stroke and you're saying to them, look, I think we can get that hand better. I think we can get it open. I think there's a lot of potential there. They'll say, no, be too late. It can't be done, can't be done, um, but it's not too late. So after the, the plateau, you have all these neurons rush back online, you get a lot of return. But after that plateau, their brain is just, your guys' brains are just as neuroplastic as mine is. You have, you have a couple problems. One is the portion of the brain dedicates that movement originally, part of it is dead. You have learned non-use where you've, that portion of the brain has pruned away. What we find often is that you guys know this, right? So my right hand, I know this is probably showing up the opposite way on the Zoom meeting, but my right hand is controlled by the opposite side of the brain. What we find is that 
sometimes when the stroke survivor does something like constraint induced, where they force use of that affected side, the ipsilateral side, the same side starts to control. So now I got the right hand being controlled by the right side of the brain. And that's fine. We don't care where it happens. It borrows neurons from the wrong part of the brain. Who are we to judge? The brain does what it's supposed to do. It does what its owner asks it to do. And so something like constraint induced will take somebody who's not motivated and force them to use that limb. And is it frustrating? Yes. Is it ugly? Yes. Is it in some ways depressing? Yes. Um, but the things that work the best are the same things that work with athletes and musicians. It's a lot of sweaty, ugly, hard work. You know, I'm I wanted sure to when... just add to that when you get yes, through. Ma'am. Yeah, oh, no. please now. Now's no. a good time. I need a breath. <laughs> <laughs> My father, who had a hemorrhotic stroke and was paralyzed on the entire left side of his body, I was exercising his, uh, I believe it was his right arm, the paralyzed side. I was exercising that arm and that leg. And the nurses and the doctor put him in a sling. Now he's in a sling and I'm feeling very frustrated because I had been able to get movement in the arm. And now it's stuck in this sling to his body. And I was very frustrated and they were telling me, well, that's the way it is. I feel that if I had the opportunity, I didn't have a lot of hours, I was there six hours a day. The amount of time, if I could exercise it, maybe it wouldn't have been that spastic and maybe I would have been able to bring it back because when he went for physical therapy, they just gave up on that part. And then he ended up with it just stuck to his chest. And I was very frustrated about that. So you, that's really, I'm sorry, Peter. I just wanted to add that, you know, we always talk on this show and Judy and Mark, everybody, Eileen, Stacy, know that, you know, we always believe that you should have a team of people around you. You should build that team of people you trust around you before you get into a situation where you need them, because that way, you don't have to go looking for someone that you trust. And, and like you said, Judy, you know, the therapist said, no, well, you know, now. They all said, no, the doctor, the sir, they all said no. And yet I was able to um, exercise his arm, bring it up and back and over. Okay. It was hard. Okay. I was struggling with it, but there was movement. The minute they put it into that permanent sling, that was the end of it. They wouldn't let me exercise it. It got worse with time and there was no help after that. Right. His leg, I was able to continue moving. Yeah, and then Peter, this is something interesting. Peter and Mark, you weren't on our last show, but Stacy brought something up, which maybe both of you could target into, is um, you know, as much as encouragement, as much as you need to be a cheerleader, sometimes it goes to, too too hard on the patient and they feel like they're being stressed out and they feel like they're being pressured too much. And I know that sometimes I would get so combobulated that I would just back up and not listen and I couldn't hear them. So talk to us about that, Peter and Mark, about, you know, um, about that balance in between. Well, uh, when I first had my stroke, being in the hospital, uh, couldn't move, <laughs> needed help for everything. And uh, my wife, my caregiver, saved my life. Um, mm. She would come in and you wouldn't see on her face the concern that she had. She was just a, a, a big cheerleader and <laughs> we can do it and go for it. Peter, my question to you, and you kind of answered it was, when you have a stroke and you get all the uh, 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 things back and you plateau, but after that plateau, you still get smaller gains. Why is that? Well, it's the gains are smaller because you don't have this, um, this free ride. You don't have the free ride of all these billions of neurons coming back online. 
remember you have the area that's dead and then around it, you have this area that's alive, but stunned. And those start to rush back and you get this really high trajectory. Now, after the plateau, as you point out, as you just said very well, um, you get smaller gains. And so the people that are very highly successful, and I think we're, we have a couple of them in this group, are, are people that once they plateau, they still chip away, just the way an athlete would. It's just a chip. You talk to an athlete and you say, uh, hey, um, are you okay with plateauing? Um, and they say, no, that's retirement or that's, you know, losing. You know, you're always trying to, as a musician, musicians in a way, like an athlete is plateaued by their age. Eventually you plateau because you're getting older. Musicians kind of never plateau. We're always trying to learn something new. But those are very difficult gains. The, the easier gains are when the brain is just giving you a free ride. Then after that, it gets uh, much more difficult. And also as the, pers as the person with the stroke, you don't feel the small incremental gains because you're living it. You have to, so, you know, when you, when you have um, real differences every day and then it's just a tiny step, it's sort of frustrating. I found for me, I, I was um, paralyzed on the left hand side and I would sit on the couch with my hand in the air and say, move, come on, move. <laughs> move. And it, for, for months. One day I was coming home from the center and I had my lunch box. My mother and I are walking in my house and I stopped. She said, what's the matter? I said, look at me, look. I'm holding the my hand, my box in my left hand. It just happened. <laughs> and That's also incredible. if you're paralyzed and uh, if you have spasticity in let's say your left arm, couldn't you take your right arm and just try to raise it up. Just I did that from the it. beginning. I, when I would sit to eat for lunch, I would put my left hand on the um, table just to stop food or whatever, but just so it was participating in it. So, <clears throat> oh, sorry. No, and, so, and, what, one of the things you, you're bringing up, uh, just one second, because um, you bring up a great point. The small incremental changes are really difficult to measure. And that's what you're talking about. From day to day, the, the stroke survivor often doesn't see. That's the great thing about working in a rehabilitation research lab like I did, because you're always collecting data. You're always doing what's called kinematics, where you go into a, you, you take infrared pictures of little changes in movement. Um, that's what's great about look, using fMRI to look at the brain, because the stroke survivor doesn't see the changes, but we do. And one of the things I strongly advocate stroke survivors do is videotape themselves so that you have something that you can measure from. If you can, like at, you said, my hand opened one day. Well, how far did it open? Why not take a ruler, and I have one around here, and say, let's measure how. Let's make it a competition. I can open an inch. I'm going for two inches. And so that way you bring in the athletic thing. But measurement is a huge deal. Thank you, Stacy. Yes. Um, I just want to let everybody know we only have nine minutes left. And this show just is incredible. And I just, um, you know, we could talk forever on a subject. And, uh, you know, I, as always, um, before we run out of time, I do want to invite Peter back so we can continue this conversation. Um, and, of course, everybody else is invited as well. And, Mark, I really want to invite your wife onto a show so that we can hear her. Oh, bye. Right oh. Bye. Uh, <laughs> so we can we can bring her her on to the story and maybe um, Peter and Mark would be on the same show with your wife so that we could talk a little bit about that. I don't That's know. That's really important because we would get to hear about your stroke, how it affected your wife from the moment you started having the symptoms to, you know, everything that happened, her discussion, um, calling 911, the discussion with the hospital, with the doctors, with the surgeon, if there was one, uh, your rehabilitation. I mean, she went through a, a lot and it was yeah, devastating. She, and she has a really important story to share. Yes, she does. Thank yes. You. So before we go, um, I, you know, we have eight minutes left, but um, Peter, we spoke about your blog 
I know this is really passionate to you because um, it's um, an, a really a stream of information that people can get on a regular basis. So share with us about your blog and, and where we could find your blog. So it's simple to find. If you, if you can find Google, you can find it. It's Stronger After Stroke blog. And, uh, and, and it'll be the first hit, I promise. And what, and, and what, and what, what, what kind of information? Um, I wrote a, uh, an entry recently. How much does it cost to have a stroke? Mm. How much does it cost? So it turns out that the estimate is about $150,000 to have a stroke. Now, I bet if we talk to Mark, he'd be talking about millions of dollars. <laughs> because it has to do with it has to do with career. In a lot of countries in Europe, there is no loss of income. Your income continues. Now there's probably loss for a variety of reasons, but not these huge impacts that we have in the United States. So it's that kind of stuff that it doesn't go into a peer reviewed journal article. It's sort of my opinion about things. Um, it's that kind of extemporaneous stuff that um, the blog is good for. Wow. And oh, and so also the caregiver has to quit their job. Thank you. To take care of the um, of their dad, their husband, their wife, whatever it is. Testify. So they're going to lose. And and in my case, I had to do that by taking a part time job, hiring someone to watch my dad for a certain period of time. And then uh, let's say I would pick up about three o'clock and be there till nine or whatever. Okay, I wouldn't leave till I knew he was comfortable. That costs money. You know, I've, yeah. I've been in many um, recovery support groups. And when everybody gets done stating their story, that is always the topic of conversation about insurances, um, the struggles that they have. I mean, I'll never forget there was one story where this the the wife had the husband was home the wife had to go to work um on her her you know on the way to on a way to work she would call the then you know somebody um during her lunch break during her her coffee break she would be on the phone then afterwards i mean it just changes your life and what about those caregivers that can't quit their job what if they're the main income for their family because because um you know insurances you know, uh, long-term insurance doesn't kick in right away. I mean, and PSE and GIO, we say, and, uh, and your mortgage, they really don't care that you suffered a stroke, you know? So it, it really is in, 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 in our philosophy and my foundation's philosophy is that um, money and insurance shouldn't be the, the recovery, shouldn't be the first quote thing for recovery. It should be love. You should support that person through love to, to help them to heal. Money and everything else can be fixed later on, you know? And, and I know that there's, there's gotta be a balance between it. And, and I really went down to Washington DC with the American Stroke Association and fought for, for recovery, for insurance, for advocacy, because I really do believe that they have, there's gotta be a balance. And my thing is that we don't want to share with the insurance companies how to operate, but we want to work with them to make it better for everybody, you know? So, you know, it, it really, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a partnership, you know, we understand, like I had, um, I had, um, uh, an, a congressman who did, what is Michael Fitzpatrick. What does he do for, he's an he's assemblyman. assemblyman, an assemblyman, an assemblyman on my show. And I'm open to listen to, all different sides in politics, you know, and because I'm a business. You also had Andrew Raya. Yes, yes. But, but Michael had shared with me the business side of, um, of, of doing a budget, you know, for, for, um, for insurances and stuff. And, and I get it. I do. But I also am very passionate and, and don't believe that that insurances or anything should come before love and support when somebody suffers a stroke, because if it was your family, you would be right on it. You would be right on it. Your mindset would change. So, and my thing is don't let it happen to your family before you do something, before you do something. So that's my, my spiel. <laughs> and you do it so well. <laughs> yes, it comes from the heart, you know? Yes, it does. 
Yeah. Peter, do, is there, share with us where they could find your books and, and how many books you've written, because I know you have, because the first book was written and it was written in a more simple form, right? Because the publisher said to put in a more simple form. Are your following books the same format? So I, I do have a second book. I just wrote a book about travel, believe it or not. I wrote a book about travel right as COVID was hitting and nobody is going to travel ever again. <laughs> you know, great timing. Don't say uh, that. <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, and, and that's off to the publisher now, but I only, about stroke, I only have one, one book. Um, oh, so it was updated, but it was. So it was updated. So the third edition looks like that. Um, yeah. And um, it's available everywhere. I mean, just Google it. It'll, you'll, you'll be able to buy it at Amazon or anywhere you want to. Wow. So I just, thank you, Peter. I just want to go around the table. We have two minutes left. Um, did Judy, do you have any last minute comments on today's shows? Just have empathy for what the other person is going through and be positive as much as possible and surround the loved ones <laughs> with people who are going to be positive, to, not to be pushy, but to be positive and say nice things to them rather than uh, saying something that could add to the, uh, them being discouraged. Wow. Eileen? I'm with Judy. Every, everything you said and with um, Dr. Peter as a dancer who had a severe accident, I'm still dancing. And Good. <laughs> we all have our connections that stay together and we just have to be diligent and patient in uh, reconnecting them. Yes, yes. Stacy. So everyone is talking about um, positivity. In my recovery, there was this little tiny word that, that had a big difference. If whenever I had trouble with something, I'd say, I'm not doing that yet. And that little yet, keep kept hope alive. So wow. I love that. Stacey. No, I'm glad you said yeah. that. Yeah. Mark, well, your last uh, comments? Um, for every stroke survivor, you can remember the time before the stroke and the time after a stroke. These days when people see me and they say, I had no idea you had a stroke, but guess what? I did. And so I remember uh, the heartache and just uh, not saying anything at first because I thought everyone knew that I had a stroke. And then I, I couldn't find the milk at the grocery store. I went up front and said, where's the milk? And the girl said, uh, excuse me? I thought <laughs> she couldn't understand me, but she was busy and thinking about her boyfriend. <laughs> so uh, once she said, oh, it's back there, I thought, heck with this. From here on out, I'm going to uh, own it and uh, 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 speak the way I do and be the way I am. Uh, uh, Peter, I have one question. My balance is off. If I turn too fast to the right, I tend to wobble. Why is that? You know, there's a bunch of things involved with balance. One is proprioception. Um, if your sensation is diminished, uh, sometimes that can be the problem. Sometimes it's an inner ear thing. Sometimes it's just a coordination thing. You can't get your foot around quick enough to hold your balance. Here's what I would suggest. You know what I'm going to suggest. Take up dance. Done. Done. A lot of repetitions are going after that balance, and I bet it will come back. Okay. Um, that reminds me. There was something else I wanted to say. Um, when, when you have practice, find something that you enjoy doing. I, I used to go to this um, occupational therapy and I'd screw the um, bolts on the, on the, um, the nuts on the bolts for hours. And it boring. was boring. And then I started doing my jewelry <laughs> making again and my fine motor is fine now. Because wow. I liked it. You were doing something you enjoyed doing. Yeah. 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 So Peter, did you want to wrap it up and state 
Um, so what, you know, what would be your biggest or most, I mean, I'm sure there's tons, but what advice would you give to us stroke survivors? What simple advice would you give to us stroke survivors? What a great question. So broad. Um, I, know. I would, I would say that the most successful stroke survivors that I've met, and there's a few in this room right now, um, are people that once they were discharged from therapy, didn't, well, uh, as Stacy said, uh, they said to themselves, I'm not doing that yet. I, why am I giving up just because they gave up on me? Um, and usually it's wrapped up in something that they love to do anyway. And so their recovery becomes a natural part of them getting their life back. That's all. Just follow, follow that. I think do what you love to do and, and uh, try to get better at doing it. Yes. You, Peter. Peter, we, we want to thank you for being our guest today. Um, you really brought a different perspective to it. And what I love about your, your mindset is that you do listen to what the stroke patients are saying to you. And then you filter that into your intelligence as far as your education. And you're trying to really bridge that gap between um, the doctors and the patients. And that is really, really, really important. So I really wanna take, you know, take a moment to thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, it really is impactful. Um, I know a few hospitals here in New Jersey that I'm gonna send your information to because I think you would be a great um, speaker at a, at a, at a therapist um, uh, group you know, just so they could, they could, they could learn. You could continue to learn. Like we continue to practice. We continue to get better whenever at our platform. So I, I believe that you would be an excellent um, speaker. So. Thank you. This, this has been a thrill. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for coming, for joining us. Hey, dog. attention to the barking dog. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I he comes in and sits on the couch. And Judy, listens to you. Thank you, everyone. We have to roll out because thank you, Jim, in the studio for dealing with us and for letting us go a little bit longer than we have. We're so blessed, everybody, to have this opportunity to come into your lives for an hour, um, for two hours today. And we hope that you will share this information with those that need it because this was a really, there were two really important shows about positivity, about um recovery from a stroke and i'm sorry my landscape was doing my lawn outside that's why i kept putting my my speaker my speaker on a mute but um we we invite everybody to come back because this can the conversation needs to continue we need to support those that have suffered from strokes and my new book one of my new books out of three or four is love them through it love them through it that's the first key to any illness or any challenge everybody has in life especially during this pandemic so love them through it here we go everybody on three we're gonna blow kisses and thank you so much ready one two three bye everybody have a wonderful day you thank, all. You. Bye. thank you
Okay. Say hi to Renee. Hi, Renee. Can you hear them? Say it again. Put the video on. I can't see you. Oh, they're on the camera. Yeah, up what, um, what camera? Do I, have to do? I can't change the camera here. I don't know how to change the camera. Okay. okay. Uh, All right. They just got here. They're ready to start. All right. Thank you for right. dealing with us today. No problem. Thank you, Renee. Bye. I'll, I'll see, see you later. Bye-bye. Bye. All set? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Can't say I'm sorry enough. I don't even know what to say. I'm so pissed. Uh, I'm not very comfortable. What if you had a um, a bedpan? <laughs> well, you guys are. Well, I found a place. There's a meter around the building across the street. Just read the meter. That's all I did. <laughs> oh, here's the meter. We can read. Okay, I finished. That's good. Bad. His bills are paid up. I am not happy. I have yeah, to go pay pay. I am not happy. I am not happy. Not happy with Oh, I like that picture. So I got it from Amazon. We're gonna tout the book. I didn't get the other I didn't buy the other book yet. Or I, Daniel's I didn't read message? Yeah, you so can probably get that on message. Kindle, I think, right? Yeah, Daniel's message. Yeah, damn it. That's that's a novel. That's Do you need him closer? Wow. Please don't tell me we're going to have malfunctions now. Do you need Dion closer? Do you mean, me? mean closer? How we, how we, how we, if the set and can. Just let me know. Sounds my phone before we Sounds go on here because right. I'll get a million.